Hello, health champions. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 foods that destroy your liver. And these are in no particular order. So we're going to start with refined carbohydrates. And these are things like white rice and white flour used to make white bread. And refined means that we have taken something away from them. And when they take something away, then they often add something a little bit back. And they call that to enrich the food. And just to give you the right perspective on how rich you get is they take away a dollar and they put back a penny. That's what enriched foods are. That's why refined foods and refined carbs are something you want to reduce or stay away from. But it can also be things like fruit juice because the whole fruit is a whole food, even though I don't think that you should eat it completely unlimited. But once you turn it into fruit juice, now you've taken away a lot of the beneficial things and you have refined it to where the sugar is completely available for fast absorption. And a couple of more examples are things like crackers and rice cakes. And even if they use whole grain to make the rice cakes, they've still changed them. They fluffed it up so that the surface area is different and you have faster access to the sugar in those carbohydrates. And the reason this matters for liver disease is that the vast majority of liver disease is caused by metabolic problems such as blood sugar problems, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes. So we have to understand what a carbohydrate is. Why are we even talking about this? And this is a glucose molecule. It's the most basic form of carbohydrate. And this is the exact molecule that ends up in the bloodstream as blood glucose. So every cell in your body can use glucose and every animal on the planet can use glucose. And when we talk about carbohydrates, some people call rice and wheat and grains complex carbohydrates. And they say that these are good things. You should eat a lot of these things. But all it means is that we string these glucose molecules together in hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of molecules branched together. And this is called starch but it's not really that complex because it only takes a few seconds to start breaking these connections. And now we have free individual glucose molecules that can get into the bloodstream very, very quickly. And now what happens when we raise blood sugar is we also raise insulin. And if we eat these foods on a regular basis, now we get chronically elevated insulin and high insulin promotes lipogenesis. It promotes the formation of fat, turning the excess carbohydrate into fat because that's the only way that we can get rid of it and store it. And of course, when we turn things into fat, some of this is going to happen in the liver and contribute to that fatty liver called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But there's one more way that refining food damages food and damages the body. And that is that we deplete them. We take something away that was valuable, nutrients that the body needed. When we process this food, when we break it down and turn it into energy, we need vitamins and minerals that were originally in the food. But when we take those away, now the body is suffering and the liver especially. And we'll come back and talk a little bit more about that. Number two on the list is sugar. And this is a particular type of carbohydrate that is worse than just the starch made up of glucose. And sometimes they call this white sugar or brown sugar. Sometimes they call it sucrose, high fructose corn syrup, agave. And it's still basically the same thing. And what's different than just the starch is that in addition to this glucose molecule, now we have a fructose molecule. And this is a different chemical configuration. So the glucose can be used by every cell in your body, but the fructose can only be processed by the liver. So with sugar, because there's two types of molecules in that sugar, 
Now we have two mechanisms that are damaging. And the first is the same. We raise blood sugar, we raise insulin, we create insulin resistance and fat storage, some of which is in the liver. But now we have this second mechanism from the fructose because the fructose can only be processed in the liver and therefore we tend to overwhelm the liver very, very quickly. If we just had a teaspoon now and then, we'd be fine. But when we start eating massive amounts of sugar that contain 50% approximately of fructose, now there is way, way, way more fat building lipogenesis in the liver. And therefore we're gonna overwhelm and create a fatty liver much, much faster with sugar than just with starch. And these two factors are really the driving force behind metabolic syndrome or syndrome X that causes metabolic disease. And with that, we see things like cardiovascular disease, increased blood pressure associated with high risk of stroke, visceral fat, and the progressed form of insulin resistance called type two diabetes. And the reason we talk so much about this in connection with the liver is that the vast majority, 55 to 70% of people with type two diabetes are also going to have a fatty liver. Now, I also wanna mention saturated fats and clarify a few things because it's usually brought up as a causative factor with fatty liver disease. But when you really look into it, it's not a causative factor, it's associated with. And that's because the people who oftentimes have diabetes, they are not the people who take that good care of themselves. So they tend to eat a lot of saturated fat as well. And with very high insulin levels and metabolic problems, now saturated fat is not a good thing in combination, but it's not the causative factor. And some of you may have seen a couple of videos I did where I ate 100 eggs in a seven days, or I ate 100 hamburgers in 10 days, I think it was. And that's not to show you that saturated fat is so great. It was just to kind of get some attention to the fact that we're focusing on the wrong thing. And I did blood work before and after, and I showed that the blood work did not get worse. I did not drive myself toward metabolic problems in any way. Whereas with other videos, I ate normal American diet with a lot of processed foods and my blood work got dramatically worse in a very short period of time, in about seven to 10 days. But that's not me trying to say that this is an optimal diet. Eating one-sided is never a good idea. And if you eat that much saturated fat for a long period of time, you're going to unbalance something because you're just not eating enough of the other kinds of food. So what we want to do is we want to eat a diet with balance. And that does not mean that you follow the balance of the dietary guideline with lots and lots of grains and 10% of your calories from added sugar and 65% of your calories from carbohydrates. To me, that's not balanced. You eat real whole food, which can include a fair good amount of grass-fed beef, grass-fed butter, which are good sources, which means the saturated fat in there is very healthy. The animals were raised in a healthy way. You can also eat plenty of extra virgin olive oil and some coconut oil, especially for cooking. And then you want to eat other forms of fat like nuts and seeds and avocado, where the fat is still in there. Because saturated fats and monounsaturated fats like extra virgin olive oil, they're very healthy, they're very stable. They don't get damaged easily by light and oxygen. And then of course, you also wanna eat a wide variety of non-starchy vegetables. If you eat a diet like this, you don't have to worry about saturated fat because you're not driving insulin and the quality of the fats that you're eating are overall very good. Number three on the list are popular drinks. And most people, they know that soft drinks, soda, has a lot of sugar in it. So you could get, in just a one can serving, you get about 40 grams, but a lot of servings in restaurants or other bottle sizes, 
you could get up to 70 grams in a single bottle. There are other drinks where people don't associate them necessarily. They know they're not great for you, but they don't think they're as bad as soft drinks. So coffee drinks, very popular drinks now, are 50 to 70 grams of sugar. And most people going in to buy a coffee, they splurge a little bit, they get something with that's more like candy, but they don't think it's as bad or worse than a soft drink. And then there are things marketed as energy drinks that have just as much sugar, then iced tea, people think, oh, they're just drinking tea with a little sweetener. Well, this could be every bit as much as the other drinks in terms of sugar. Even drinks like vitamin water, some of those are unsweetened or maybe sweetened with stevia or worse, some artificial sweetener, but others still have sugar and you could get 20, 30 grams of sugar in a serving of vitamin water, which of course is the kind of defeats the purpose of trying to get vitamins. Then you have milkshakes. People think, oh, well, that's just milk. That's just a little sweetened milk. Well, you could get 50 to 90 grams of sugar in there. And even very healthy, supposedly alternatives like coconut water, some of them could be unsweetened and then they still would have eight to 10 grams in a glass or in a serving, but some of them are actually sweetened. And depending on the size, you could get 50 grams of sugar in something that you believe was healthy for you. So I'm bringing these up because a lot of people drink these and don't really reflect or realize on how much sugar is in there. And the US guidelines suggest that you could have 10% of calories from added sugar, which would be 50 grams. And I think that is already too much. And even so, most of these drinks, especially a larger size, would put you over that limit already. I believe that you should have no more that your daily intake should be zero to 20 grams, which is four teaspoons. That means you have a little honey in your coffee. That means you have just that little bit of sweetener in, in your beverage or whatever, but it doesn't mean that you add massive amounts of sugar into your drinks or in your foods. And most people know that the United States kind of wrote the book on obesity and diabetes back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. However, the rest of the world is catching up so quickly. I wanna show you some of the stats for diabetes because again, type two diabetes is the number one driving factor for liver disease, for fatty liver that can progress into inflammatory liver disease and cirrhosis and even worse. So here are just a few samples of the largest countries with the highest rates of diabetes. So these are for adults over 18 years. Brazil has 8.8%. We have India at 9.6%. The United States at 10.2%. So even though the United States used to be the example of the absolute worst in times of diabetes, now we have other countries that are basically at the same, or as you'll see, much, much worse. We have Indonesia at about the same as the US. China is about the same. And then with Mexico, we're taking a huge jump, 15.9%. We have the United Arab Emirates at 16%. We have Egypt, 17%. Saudi Arabia at 18%. And then Pakistan at over 30% diabetes among adults. So I'm bringing this up to show you that this is a worldwide problem today, that we have some of the largest countries in the world. We have countries represented on virtually every continent in the world. So this is not a United States problem or a Western problem. This is a global problem and it is growing exponentially. Number four on the list is alcohol. And there are two things that only the liver can break down. There are no other cells in the body that can break down a significant amount, and that is alcohol and fructose that we talked about. So most people know that alcohol is bad for you, and it used to be that virtually all liver problems were related to alcohol, and today the vast majority of liver problems 
are associated with metabolic problems and insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So alcohol is not a great thing for you, but in moderation, it's not necessarily so bad. But there are some things that are worse than others. So if you have a mixed drink, what that means is they mix it with sugar, with very large amounts of sugar. And not only that, but now it's very easy to drink several because they don't put a whole lot of alcohol in them. They want you to go and get multiples of the daiquiris and the margaritas and so forth. And they're loaded with sugar. So you tend to drink a lot of them. Then next we have things like liqueurs. These are for dessert. And you take a tiny little glass and it's extremely sweet. They have as much as 30-40% sugar in them. But again, you're not drinking all that much. But the alcohol and the sugar now are containing the two things that are going to overload the liver, the alcohol and the fructose. Then we have things like sweet wine. That's a wine where they've added sugar. So that might be a port wine or some other sweet wine that contains both alcohol and sugar. Then we have beer, which of course has alcohol. And it doesn't have sugar, but it's pretty high in other carbohydrates. So it's not as bad as these others. And the carbohydrate is more of a starch. And then the better alternatives of being less bad are things like dry wine, dry red wine, dry white wine, and the ones that don't have any sugar at all would be the distilled liquor like vodka, gin, whiskey, bourbon, etc. But I only bring this up because I know some people are going to drink no matter what. So as long as you are going to drink, you might as well know which ones are a little bit better or a little less bad for you. But of course, make sure you keep it in moderation. Number five on the list is vegetable oil. And we all know how good vegetables are, right? We should eat as much as possible. So if we can make oil from these vegetables, that has to be a good thing. And when you go to the store, then you're going to see labels like this, pure vegetable oil and all these different kinds of vegetable oil. So I was curious as what sort of vegetables do they use to make these oils? And I went to read the label and I had my hopes up. Maybe I could find some that were made from romaine lettuce or maybe some that was made from broccoli or cauliflower. We all know how healthy those vegetables are. But imagine my surprise when it was none of those. In fact, virtually all of them had one of three things. It was a soybean oil, which is not a vegetable. It's a legume like peanuts or peas or beans. Or they had canola oil in it, which is another word for rapeseed, which is a type of seed. Another kind of seed they often use is safflower seed or sunflower seed or cotton seed. And they make oil from that, but those are not vegetables either. Or they use corn, which is not a vegetable. Even though a lot of people think that's a vegetable, it's a grain. So when they extract oil from a legume or a seed or a grain, what they're going to get is they're going to start off with an unhealthy ratio of omega-6 to omega-3s. Because if we have a one-to-one -one ratio, then we're allowing the body to regulate inflammation properly. But with these oils, we often get as much as a 20 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And now we're pushing the body. There's a greater tendency for a pro-inflammatory state. So that's bad in itself. But the biggest problem with these is that they need very high heat, very high pressure, and even chemicals to extract the oil from these resources. And as a result now, you have an oil that tastes bad, that smells bad, and that has molecules that have been damaged from all the harsh processing. So in the end, you end up with something that's about as nutritional as plastic. Number six is fried food. And we've all heard how bad fried food is, but the main reason they tell you is 
that it has too many calories. And that's not the reason. The reason is that you start off with the same vegetable oils that we just talked about. But in addition to that, we reuse these oils. They're not going to pour a nice batch and make some french fries or some shrimp and then toss the oil and start over. No, they're going to use that all day long. And for each time that they use it, now this oil gets more oxidized. With the extended high heat, now we get more damaged molecules, more rancid fats. But you can also imagine how some of the food that you're frying, it's going to leave residues in there. So there's going to be little traces of proteins, for example, and food particles that now get burned because they sit in that oil all day and that oil gets more and more toxic. And all these toxins, of course, are things that the liver has to detoxify and clean out because that's what the liver essentially does. Number seven is margarine and shortening. And again, we continue using these vegetable oils that were bad enough by themselves, but now we process them further. Now we add additional pressure and heat and hydrogen. We bombard them with hydrogen. And now what we're doing is we're changing the molecular structure, but with the making of vegetable oil and with frying, we do it sort of accidentally, but here they do it on purpose. They want to change these molecules. And the reason is they want to turn the liquid into something solid. And in doing that, it changes the properties. It makes it more shelf stable. And they can also bake things differently. That's why they use shortening for baking, because it makes things a little more crispy and crunchy. But the cost of that is, of course, that they started with something reasonably healthy, like a legume or a seed, but then they end up with something that is a very, very unnatural product. And they change the molecular structure on purpose, and they end up with something called trans fat. And that's a molecule that is very unnatural. It doesn't occur in nature, and therefore we don't have the enzymes to break it down. And once it gets in the body, it's very difficult for the body to get rid of it, unlike natural fats that we get in real food. And the way you can tell on a label, even if it says it has zero trans fats in it, is if it has something called partially hydrogenated soybean oil or corn oil or whatever, safflower oil. But the partially hydrogenated is the really bad. And so what they've started doing is they've gotten better. They've started fully hydrogenating, which means that they fully saturated and then they supposedly don't get the trans fats. But this is not an exact science. So it's not like they can guarantee that they fully hydrogenate 100% of the molecules. There's always going to be some that are still partially hydrogenated and other products still have the partially hydrogenated in there. But when there are such delicious natural things as the other foods we talked about, the butter and the extra virgin olive oil and so forth, why would you want to go to a Franken food that they have changed the molecular structure on purpose? It just does not make any sense to me. Number eight is processed foods. So when you go into the supermarket, when you go into your food store, then typically you're going to find the real food. The fresh food is going to be around the perimeter. And in the middle aisles is where you're going to find all of the processed foods. So there's several hundred, maybe a couple of thousand natural foods, more or less, but there's up to 50,000 of these processed foods. These are the packaged, the shelf-stable foods that can sit there and last forever. And the problem is that they have made them shelf-stable on purpose, but in doing that, they're using virtually all of these negative, all these bad ingredients that we've talked about so far in the video. So things like white flour and sugar and high fructose corn syrup and the vegetable oil, so to speak. And now you know why all these in themselves are terrible for you, but then you combine them all in one product and now it just gets that much worse. 
You have the hydrogenated, the partially or fully hydrogenated oils, which gives you some amount of trans fats. And then of course, they ha still have to add some preservatives, which are chemicals that make the food unattractive to mold and bacteria and yeast and so forth. And now because they've removed anything that has any flavor except sugar, they have to add back flavors with artificial flavors and they make to have it look attractive with artificial colors. And then of course, this food is highly processed and highly depleted, meaning nutrients deficient. They remove everything that can spoil which is usually what the nutrients do. And that's an additional problem for the liver because what the liver does, the purpose of the liver, it's very, very highly metabolically active. It's a very active organ. It uses a lot of energy, a lot of resources in doing detox, which is another word for biotransformation. It has to transform all the things that are left over, the foreign toxins, and the metabolic waste, it has to be transformed so that we can get rid of it. And this uses up a lot of resources. So in phase one, biotransformation, what the body does, it uses enzymes, which are little keys, little catalysts, to neutralize some of these toxins, to make them less harsh. And these enzymes depend on several different things to make them work, to activate them. So you have, most of the B vitamins, the B2, B3, B6, B9, and B12 are all involved with activating these enzymes in the liver. But you also need antioxidants because a lot of these toxins and, and waste is going to be free radicals. So we need antioxidants, which are vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E. Of course, the most natural form we could get, which we get from food and also selenium. Those are the classic antioxidants. But these enzymes are also assisted by cruciferous vegetables, cruciferous greens, and those little phytonutrients, these chemical compounds that you find in those vegetables. So in phase one, we neutralize a lot of the toxins, but they're still not water soluble. So the body can't get rid of them. They're still mostly fat soluble. So in phase two detox, now the liver does what's called conjugation. And that means it hooks it together with something that is water soluble so that the whole complex becomes water soluble and we can flush it out. And these are things like amino acids, especially some amino acids that contain sulfur, such as in the amino acid methionine and in cysteine. And the body also uses those two sulfuric amino acids to make glutathione, which is the body's number one intracellular antioxidant. And also a lot of whole rich natural food contains some other things like polyphenols, fiber, vitamins, and minerals that also assist the liver in its biotransformation process. So by eating all the junky foods that we're talking about, not only are you clogging up the liver with fat, but you're also eating depleted foods. You're depriving the liver of the nutrients that it needs to clean itself out and to clean out all the other junk for the rest of the body that is really its job. Number nine on the list is fast food. And as attractive as it is, the idea of eating fast food, what allows it to be fast and cheap is, of course, that it uses a lot of the same things that we just talked about with the processed food. It has a lot of white flour. It has a lot of sugar and high fructose corn syrup. And it is usually cooked in vegetable oils. And the dressings they use are these so-called vegetable oils. And again, most of the flavor that doesn't come from sugar is now added through artificial flavors and colorings. And now that you know most of the things that will destroy the liver, the types of foods, I want to bring your attention back to this graphic, just to really put this in perspective. Because we want to understand that type 2 diabetes, which is the strongest association with a fatty liver, is a disease or a condition that's not supposed to exist at all. 
hundreds of years ago, it was almost unknown. It would be extremely rare. So basically, it's eating all of the foods that I've talked about in this video that creates this epidemic. And it's not even really a disease. It's an adaptation that by pushing the body out of balance, by feeding it junk and things it's not supposed to have for years and years and years and decades in most cases, the body adapts and finally we break it through this constant abuse. And again, this is not something that's limited to a few countries. This is all over the place. And just to give this some perspective that for something that's not supposed to exist to have in Brazil, one in 11 adults has type 2 diabetes. In India and the US, it's one in 10. In Indonesia and China, it's one in nine adults. In Mexico, United Arab Emirates and Egypt, it's one in six. In Saudi Arabia, it's one in five adults that have this condition that is gonna lead them to a premature death and a possible liver failure. And it is completely self-acquired. And in Pakistan, there is now one in three adults that have type 2 diabetes. But we're doing this to ourselves by adopting a lifestyle that is very, very unnatural. It is sedentary, and then we're feeding our bodies these non-foods. Number 10 is baked goods or pastries. And here we have things like donuts and muffins. We have cinnamon rolls, cookies. We have Pop-Tarts, cupcakes, and the list goes on and on and on. And now these foods that are the most addictive and people love the most, they have really nothing redeeming about them because they contain virtually nothing but these things that we're supposed to avoid, like white flour, sugar, and the oils that we've talked about. They contain chemicals, artificial flavors, artificial colors, and they contain preservatives. Now, when I grew up, we still had these things. We, we usually made them ourselves. They were baked at home, but it was not an everyday thing like it is becoming now. And that's the problem, that these things that were supposed to be treats, they are becoming staples. And it's not just happening in some places, it's happening all around the world. And that's what's driving these epidemics. And yet I had no idea until I looked it up how common this is. So I picked Pop-Tarts, for example, and I've never had one. I just looked at it and knew that's not food. But when I looked it up, I found out that there were 140 million people in the United States, way more than a third of the population, who eat these things on a regular basis. Not just Pop-Tarts, but related toaster products. So we have to start understanding that nothing that we've talked about in this video is actually food, and yet this is becoming the staples that we're eating, and this is what's driving these epidemics. If you enjoyed this video, you're gonna love that one. And if you truly wanna master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.